Okay, so you probably guessed, but I'm Anna, that's Andrew, sitting behind me. <laughs> so what we're going to talk to about today is what really matters for teachers. So you've probably been listening for three days about technology in the classroom and what a difference it makes and what's good. Um, but we're going to try and distill that into what we think really, ha really matters for teachers and how they can be supported. So first of all, I'm going to talk about what teachers need to know. So the technologies that we think are here and well established and here to stay. And then a bit about new and exciting ones that maybe aren't uh, commonplace yet but are interesting. We're going to talk about a concept we've been looking at about the, the digital teacher. What makes a confident teacher with technology who can really improve learner outcomes. And we're going to talk a bit about our framework for teachers which we've been developing. So first of all we're going to talk about technologies we think are here and here to stay. Uh, probably. Uh, things come and go and things we thought were definitely going to radicalise you know, education haven't turned out, so with a caveat. So the first one is mobile learning. So if we were talking five years ago or ten years ago, everyone was talking about how would everybody have a laptop, how would everybody have technical support in their school, how expensive is that? Um, but luckily mobile technology has caught up so much that a smartphone is so much more affordable, uh, especially high school and higher education, your students might bring their own device which means you don't need the technical support. And more and more schools are now taking this kind of approach to learning, making it much more accessible. MOOCs. So this is one of ours. We, ha we have a partnership with Future Learn. Um, this is our second one. We did one a few months ago for teachers. So MOOCs, uh, they called 2011 the year of the MOOC, and that was five years ago. So we think they're also here to stay. So anyone who doesn't know, a MOOC is a uh, massive, uh, usually free, so open online course which means between about 10,000 and uh, 400,000, I think, was the biggest course. But they've changed a bit. So when they first started, they were talking about how they would have to find models that worked. And the different providers of MOOCs have gone in different directions. So some of them are targeting uh, the corporate sector where employers are paying. Uh, some of them are putting courses together to make qualifications. and uh, Others are giving credit for people who do their courses then go on to university. And lots of other different kinds in between. So the other one, I'm sure people have talked about it here, uh, the flipped classroom. So when I was preparing this, I had to think about, I, I was trying to find out who had coined the term. But I was surprised to find out that it's very nearly 10 years old. So it's been 10 years since two teachers first decided they could record their lectures, um, put them online, have their students look the night before, and then spend more time in the classroom doing the things where they can really make a difference intervening or doing communicative practice. Most people know about this and, and there's different forms of this and teachers generally aware what it is. But it's taken nearly 10 years. The next one is this one, teachers know best. So again, if we were doing this talk five or 10 years ago, we would have been debating, will technology replace teachers? You, you don't normally hear anything like that now. People are more likely to talk about how valuable teachers are and how important they are in making sure that technology really improves learner outcomes. Uh, but they do talk about this. This is Stephen Wheeler. So it's very important that teachers are trained and are able to apply all the expertise that they have to make the best of technology. Which means recommendation by teachers is very important. More products are recommended by them that are designed for teachers. They're generally a lot better. We decided the best way to look at this was see what teachers were really recommending. So this was a course that we did. It finished a few weeks ago and we had 35,000 teachers sign up. We were expecting people who were just interested in learning about teaching, but we actually got a lot of experienced teachers. And this is where they were from. So we think we have nearly every country in the world in very, very different contexts. Annie King was talking earlier, and some of those are in that kind of context where they have 50 students. Um, some of them are teaching distance because they're the school and every village comes to them once a week. So this isn't very scientific because there are hundreds of thousands of lines of data that we have. but. Based on what they were talking about and the things that we presented for them to use and the feedback that we got, these are the most popular tools. And it's mostly because they're the most versatile, uh, they work well on any device, some of them work offline, um, and anyone can use them. So the first one is Kahoot. You go online, you make a quiz, the teacher does. The students go on a link and it turns their phone into a voting device. And then uh, in class they say A, B, C or D. And it's a great way to introduce mobile technology because you can see what everyone's doing. It's quite controlled and structured. Uh, it's simple and, of course, it gives a teacher real-time feedback as to whether their students have understood what they're talking about. So, so that was a very popular one. And, and of course, it's, it's motivating and the students love it. Uh, Plickers is the same, but if your students don't all have a device, it will still work. 
So you print out a card or a piece of paper with a code on, and your students hold it this way for A, this way for B, and the teacher just uses their phone to scan the classroom, and then you get the same thing. So a graph, you know, 80% said A, 20% said B. So even if your students don't have devices, the, the technology can give you that. Quizlet is probably the best known. Uh, apparently, it's the biggest ed tech site in the US. Um, again, it was very popular because it's very well designed for teachers. It's very simple. Uh, you make quizzes, you can keep them, you can use other people's quizzes. Uh, you can see how your students are doing. And this one also works offline. So for where technology isn't so good, you can set homework, they can do it in their own time. When they come back to class or somewhere where, where there's Wi-Fi, you'll see their results. And Padlet was probably the single most popular. We included this on the course, but because it's so versatile. It's just an online notice board, you can put things up. Uh, students can post things, they can work together. Um, and teachers can use it themselves as a tool for their own organisation. Which is the other thing that we saw. Another thing that has changed is people are now talking more about teachers using technology that isn't designed for education, but just helps them in other ways. So helps them to be organised or share homework with their students or collate all the pieces of work. And these were the ones that teachers on the course were mostly talking about. And most of them have dedicated sites to help teachers get to use their technology. But there was a real cultural difference. So we had teachers who used WhatsApp and Facebook with their students all the time. And others who thought that was completely inappropriate to use social media with their students. But their students would use them in study groups and their school would have a Facebook page for parents. You know, even, even people like us who have hundreds of resources available for free to teachers are trying to make them easier for teachers to use. This is something we developed. Uh, it, the teacher puts in when they're doing their exam, how many hours they have, and it creates a plan for them. They can also prioritise one skill, uh, say speaking, and there'll be more speaking content. And then it just puts together a plan, uh, including free resources that are available where they can add notes. And we put some rules behind it. So we think it's important they do a practice test before their exam. So everybody gets a practice test in the last week. And we developed this with teachers. So as we were developing it, every single stage, we just did whatever the teachers said was most important for them, which is how we ended up with something so simple. The other thing we think is here to stay uh, are adaptive technologies. So again, five years ago, we would have been saying, oh, you know, you can't learn a language purely through uh, adaptive learning. But now we understand that. But there are some parts of learning a language that are very useful. People still have to learn a lot of vocabulary. It's hard for a teacher to look at all the students in their class, especially if they're 50, and know that all these students really know this word and these ones don't. Um, but technology can really help with that. And auto-marking. So something that can give students a bit of feedback as to how they're doing, where the errors are, and help them to start to correct their own work. So this is our site, this is free to use. So we did an, our adaptive technology pilot we did last year was with this company. We looked at lots of different ones, but this one, uh, their algorithm learns your pattern of forgetting. So if I need to be presented a new vocabulary item this often, this many times to learn it, it starts to learn that. And the obvious thing for us was preparation for IELTS. So sets of vocabulary that are useful for IELTS. And of course, here to stay, learning oriented assessment is very important for us, and uh, most obviously in the product Empower that launched earlier this year. So those are the things we think are here and here to stay. But also we think it's important that teachers know about new <coughs> things that are coming, especially where they could either have a big impact or just because they're interesting and it helps people realise the value that technology can have. So stealth assessment. So this is also called invisible assessment, but I saw this term a few weeks ago and I much preferred it. So the idea that this might be replaced by this, where the system is assessing the student all the time. They don't know it or it's putting assessments into what they're doing. And it just reports when the student is competent in this area, like a certain level of speaking skill of a certain type. And AI, there's AI in lots of things that we use every day, all of us, and of course in lots of learning products. But there are more interesting applications that people are talking about now, like the idea of AI to be your learning companion that, that knows you and what worries you and what you find difficult learning and what your goals are and communicates with you or your teacher or your parent uh, in, a, in a natural way uh, that makes sense to the learner. And the idea of perhaps that the learning companion is a lifelong thing, not just something that helps motivate you to a particular goal. And uh, I don't know if they're going to look like robots, but I hope so. And of course, uh, augmented reality, that's Pokemon Go, which I don't think I probably need to tell you about on the right. The idea that you can look through your phone or another lens and see your context where you are and a layer of learning or a layer of translation or whatever it is appears in the thing that you're actually looking at. It's perfect contextualised learning 
And when you come back to learn it later, it can put it in the same context. So you've learned the word chair as it is in your kitchen. That's where you need to know it. That's where you see it again. And of course, virtual reality, if we were talking 10 years ago, it would just be video games and they made you feel a bit sick. But now it's a lot more accessible and really clever innovations like this cardboard. Um, I've got one if you want to see it after. Um, that have made it accessible to classrooms. So, of course, your teachers need a phone, but this is a, allows the teacher to go on a vir virtual field trip with their students. So, the students put their phone in the cardboard. It's a 360 video, so if you move around, you see different parts of the scene. The cardboard just puts a divider in the middle and makes the experience a bit better. And uh, Google have provided, through a program called Pioneers, guides for teachers um, for them to use in the classroom. And they can control what you're looking at. So you can take your students on a field trip to a museum, or if they were learning English, it might just be a field trip to a supermarket, somewhere where it's more authentic. And, and yeah, they, it's much more immersive, and they're going places virtually that they could never do not in a normal classroom. But you also hear this a lot. Um, this was uh, The Economist interviewing people at the World Economic Forum earlier this year. But the, but the headline is one that we see a lot. You know, it should be making a massive difference. There's such potential, and as it's getting easier and less expensive, you know, why isn't technology making more of a difference? But the thing is that it's the teachers, uh, which is why that's what we're focusing on, that, that it's not the technology, it's their teaching practice, and them learning how to really make best use of it to change the outcomes for their students, which is why we started talking about the digital teacher and what that really means, because uh, it's quite hard to define, but it's certainly not learning one tool or a set of tools or one technology. It's being informed, things change all the time, new things come, teachers need to be able to keep up with things and have ways of evaluating what might be useful for them and make a difference. They need to be trusted, uh, again Annie King was talking about this, but they need to convince their school owner, uh, parents, their colleagues, their students how important it is. Uh, they need to be trained and you know, one thing we've learned now is it's not an hour's training on a Saturday morning, it's ongoing training, support, uh, chances to reflect and of course supported. And it's about skills and competencies. It's not about learning this tool and then just doing what you did before in a different tool. Hopefully leading to a teacher who's confident and can make good choices that really make a difference to the students in their class. So to recap, this is what we think is here, uh, that it's important for teachers to know about. Some interesting things that we think are coming and are worth looking at, or at least interesting for any educator. And this idea of what makes a, a digital teacher, what really makes a difference. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Andrew, who's going to talk a bit about what we've been doing in this area. Great. Thanks, Anna. Good morning, everyone. So uh, what Anna's been outlining is really exciting in terms of digital trends and digital tools. But it can also be quite daunting for people, particularly when there are headlines like these appearing on an almost weekly basis. And one thing we've noticed at Cambridge English is that these kinds of reports, they, they rarely actually define what these digital skills actually are, nor how people are supposed to acquire them. There is obviously digital training that's out there, but in a lot of cases, that training is not coherently linked to the digital skills that people need. Another thing that uh, we've noticed at uh, Cambridge English is that when we go to conferences and speak to teachers about uh, the training that they need, the most common answer um, over the last couple of years has been confidence in using digital. Teachers often tell us uh, that they don't have confidence, they, they want help in kind of overcoming this fear that a lot of them have in, in using digital. A lot of them say they feel that, that um, things are moving very quickly and the kinds of things that Anna was talking about, they, they just don't have the confidence in the time to keep up with these digital trends. The challenge really is how do we help teachers use digital to enhance teaching and learning? And what I want to tell you about is some of the things that we're doing in Cambridge to, to help address that. Hopefully you've heard of the Cambridge English Teaching Framework. If you're here on Wednesday at Sylvanas talk, she mentioned it then. What it does is define effective teaching broadly around three areas. What teachers need to know, what they should be able to do to put that knowledge into practice and the resources and tools that they use. Well, working with ELT Jam, we've taken uh, our teaching framework further to define the additional digital skills that teachers need if they're going to succeed and prosper in 
the kind of environments and context where digital resources are becoming increasingly commonplace. So what we've developed is a digital framework for teachers. And this framework, it doesn't replace the teaching framework, because obviously teaching is, is much more than just using technology, but it, uh, it enhances it and uh, hopefully adds value to the teaching that, uh, that teachers are already doing. So what I want to tell you about is how it's structured. It's organised according to six categories. The wider digital world, the digital language teaching context, professional development, designing learning, delivering learning, and evaluating learning. And then each of those categories is broken down into a series of components. And there are 25 components in the framework uh, as a whole. These are five of the components and they come from one of the six categories. They're all from the same category. Uh, within each of the components, we then um, created something that we've called key concepts, which takes each component and we've defined within that component what are the things that <coughs> teachers need to know about. So within communication and interaction, the key concepts that we've defined are forums, blogs, wikis, polls, and surveys. So within the framework, uh, it explains a little bit more about each of those. But the ultimate objective is that we help and enable teachers to apply this in their teaching. And as I was saying at the beginning, feel more confident uh, using digital tools um, and digital resources. So to achieve that, we obviously need to link it to training. So over the next couple of months, we're creating training resources linked to each of the 25 components. And it's this training that will differentiate uh, the framework we're creating from other digital frameworks which are out there. Because it won't just be a bunch of theory for people to read, there will be some training for them to use linked to each of the components to, for them to go and, and, um, and use in the classroom and hopefully help them teach more effectively with technology. So as I say, we're going to be creating training for each of the 25 components. When we've done that, we're then going to be adding training from other training providers. So there isn't just a, a single pathway through this from, from Cambridge training. There'll be training there from other people. So within the uh, component of communication and interaction that we were just looking at, you might expect to find training on things like a wiki, social media, social tools, and so on. So what we're really trying to do is bring together digital skills, digital training tools and resources so that we create a kind of map which encourages teachers to explore, to try things out and particularly encourages those teachers who maybe feel overwhelmed, they don't know where to start, to explore the possibilities that um, teaching with technology offers. What you'll notice, if you have got time to go and have a look at the framework, what you'll notice over the next couple of months is that it's going to be changing quite a lot. So the first training resources that I was talking about will be appearing, we're hoping, at the beginning of September. We're working on them at the moment. And then over the course of September and October, we'll be putting up uh, more training resources linked to the components as we create them. And it's all free, by the way. That's the other important thing. You're probably all wondering, uh, do we have to pay for it? Uh, no, you don't. The training and the framework and everything associated with it is free. What we're trying to do, in summary, is provide uh, teachers with a way in to identifying the, the knowledge, the skills, the tools that they need to know about, provide training for each of the components, and then when we've created the training, the next phase of the project will be to provide teachers with recognition for the training that they do. So we're anticipating that that will be through micro-credentialing, like digital badges. Uh, but that phase of the project will probably be coming next year. So just to summarise what it is and what it isn't, uh, like the teaching framework, the digital framework is culturally specific and context-specific. So how it lives and how meaning is made from it depends on how it's used by teachers and managers around the world. It's, but by definition, it's a framework. It's not intended to encourage conformity. The, the components and the key concepts and the training provide a, a, a way in, provide a kind of jumping off point for teachers to find what's most relevant to them, 
what most interests them. And we all know digital uh, skills and training and tools need to be updated regularly as the world changes. So the framework will be updated regularly to reflect that. What it isn't, it's not a linear framework. So there's no starting point, there's no end point. Teachers just need to explore it in the way that's most relevant to them. Again, like the teaching framework, it's not a measurement tool. It's not supposed to be a, a, some kind of stick to beat teachers with. It's about uh, awareness raising and development. And finally, it's not just for English language teaching, but it's uh, perfectly relevant for language teachers generally. If you just remember one thing, it would be great if you remember this. This quote really sums up what we think, uh, which is that pedagogy is central to all of this. And the digital framework that we're creating is central to what we mean by this idea of a digital teacher as we start to develop that concept. Next steps, go to teachwithdigital.org, have a look at the framework. Uh, as the training goes up, there'll be a feedback uh, mechanism for you to tell us what you think of the training. We really, really, really want to get teachers' feedback about how useful the training is, how useful the framework is. The approach we're taking is obviously iterating it constantly. That's why I said it'll be changing a lot over the next few months. So, so do tell us what you think. And we have a site, Cambridge Beta site, where you can go and see the latest developments, latest digital developments from Cambridge English. And again, tell us what you think about those. There's a lot of things there now, but what isn't there at the moment is, is the training uh, that's connected with it. Okay, and I, I know from a Cambridge teacher that there's like an administrative person and then she or he can put the teachers. Is it going to be the same sort of framework? Um, maybe later. At the moment, the model is that it's free and it's, it's for individual teachers. There may be a model coming later that's more of an institutional one, but at, at the moment, that's not the case. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.